The title of today's sermon is, Lord, What Do You Want Me to Do? The passage I've chosen is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I got thinking about a question, one that was upon my mind, and the question is, does God ever make a mistake? Has he ever made any kind of mistake ever? Think about that for a moment. And if you need some time to think about that, just hit pause on the tape and think about it for a moment and then start up again. When he created the heavens and the earth, were they not a product of divine perfection? Genesis chapter 1. Do not the infinite complexities of this universe constantly point to the eternal power and divine nature of God to do infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine? When it comes to uh, justice, has God really, has he ever wronged anybody? Really? After all, who better to judge than the Alpha and the Omega, who knit us in our mother's womb, who knows every single thought, word, or deed we've ever done or will ever do? Who could better judge between two people? Are not injustices a product of a fallen world that serves multiple gods, the chief of which is self, that never stops coveting all that is seen? Every single thing that we see, we seem to want. And even when God allows us to go through tribulation, as he often does, does he not promise that if we persevere, we will become spiritually mature? Who wouldn't want that? And even if God allows us to die early in life, how is this an injustice when the wages of sin deserves death? And of course, we've all sinned. And how could it ever be an injustice considering if we have eternity within our hearts, then if we die early, that's actually a blessing to go home to be with the Lord much earlier than what we expected maybe. And has not God demonstrated perfect love by sending his son, his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die once and for everyone? Is that not love? And being slow to return... Does not Jesus Christ demonstrate his infinite mercy by offering the fallen a lifetime of chances to repent, have faith in him, and become redeemed masterpieces of his grace? Surely those who are created in God's image, and a little lower than the angels, who are only righteous because they have faith in the atoning sacrifice of the Son, dare not be like Job and ask the question, God, get down here and tell me, how are you just? How are you right? How are your decisions okay? Surely we wouldn't dare actually do that. Today's sermon is going to be about gifting. It's going to be about the divine call of God in your life. And I want to review the passage, but before I do so, I want to make a point. We can trust God. God never makes any kind of mistake whatsoever, ever. And as a reality of that, when he gives us giftings that we're going to find out here in a moment, whatever giftings he gives us, whatever call he gives us, whatever things he wants us to do is always perfect for us because he's the one who gives us those gifts in the first place. And I got thinking, praise be to God for that. So let's go into the passage a little bit here and let's look at gifting a little bit. Each believer, each believer has a divine role. So God doesn't make any mistakes. That's my first point. My second point is every single believer, no matter who you are, the moment you said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and you said, come on into my heart. I want to make you the Lord of my life. He gave you spiritual gifts and those gifts are to be used for a divine purpose and a divine role. When God saved you, ultimately, he did so with a divine task in mind. He assigned something specifically just to you to do inside of his kingdom. Even when God's eyes saw your body yet to be formed the days of your life, he still had that idea. He still had that goal. He still had that plan for you. While God does not need human hands to serve him, Acts 17, 25, out of his love, he invites his own to be his hands and feet. Living sacrifice is that through the power of the Holy Spirit can know and obey his good and perfect will. The answer to the opening question, does God ever make a mistake, ultimately is that God never makes a mistake ever. Therefore, one never needs to worry. You have a role. God has assigned a role to you. Whatever that role is, it's perfect. It's never in error. If you think about it and you're thinking about your divine role, and I hope you are by now in this sermon, you're starting to think about what does God want me to do in life? Whatever he tells you to do is perfect for you because he's going to give you the gifts to enable you to do that. And we're going to find out that in a moment. 
The reality is, is that whatever he gives you is not the product of luck or chance or fate. It is by the design of a creator who loves you very deeply, who in his justice, mercy, and grace has gifted you to do unspeakable things in accordance with his will, specifically just for you. And I think that's wonderful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made not to explore any broad path your heart desires, but to travel a narrow road and to fulfill the spiritual reason and divine purpose in which you were formed. God made you with your initials stamped, I think, upon your heart as a custom made saint, perfectly designed to do his will in your life. For example, Isaiah 42, 2 says, God made you and will keep you for his purpose. Ephesians 1, 2 says that God has chosen you for a purpose in which Psalms 138, 8 says he wants you to fulfill that purpose that he gave to you. To spend one's entire life trying to find oneself, but trying out every single possible path that you can think of will only lead to tension will only lead to frustration because until the soul starts doing what God designed the soul to do, the soul will not be satisfied ever. It's only when we bow our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I want to live up for the reason why I exist, that we actually start feeling unspeakable joy and we do great things in his kingdom. So my point number one was, does God ever make a mistake? The answer is absolutely not. My point number two is, God has assigned you a role. He didn't make a mistake. He signed you a specific role to do inside of his kingdom. Now the question is, what are you going to do with that role? So, let's talk a little bit about spiritual gifts and, and divine roles that are a possibility. I got thinking, God ultimately assigns the dust of the earth to accomplish divine roles. Initially, that might seem a little bit weird, doesn't it? Why would God ever pick us? After all, we fall short of God's glory. We are not close to him all the time. We don't always do the things that we ought to do. But yet God still chooses the dust, the people that are going to return to the dust of the earth to do great things inside of his kingdom. You know what? Whatever God asks us to do, the indwelling Christ enables us to do it. The moment a person becomes born again, he or she receives spiritual gifts, supernatural ability given by God to do great things in his kingdom. Just like no one would be expected to use a hockey stick in a tennis game. Think about that for a moment. Would you ever take a hockey stick and go into a tennis game and say, all right, I am ready. I'm going to hit that tennis ball when it comes over to me and I'm going to slam it in the other court. Would you ever use a hockey stick? Absolutely not. That'd be ludicrous, wouldn't it? It'd be really hard to do. Would anybody ever take a watermelon to a football game and say, you know what, that's going to be my football. I'm going to use the watermelon. Not likely. That wouldn't go over very well, would it? It'd be kind of foolish. And would anybody ever use a golf club in a rifle competition? Well, the golf club's not going to shoot any bullets. So obviously you're not going to take a rifle to a golf golfing competition either. You're not going to do either one because neither one would make any sense whatsoever. You would not take a tricycle to a car race. Can you imagine? Here they got Indianapolis 500 and all these cars are there and you're sitting there in a little trike and you're saying, I know I can win. And as soon as they say go, everybody takes off at lightning speed and you're there trying to go in your tricycle. Obviously, it makes a difference in life to always choose the right equipment. Well, God knows that. God knows that whatever he's going to give you to do, he must enable you to do because when we start getting inside of God's kingdom and try to do great things in his name, we can't do that on our own. We're just the dust of the earth. We're not capable of doing miracles. We're not capable of moving mighty mountains in our own effort. Only God can do that. The gifts that we get are intended to be used in a Christ-like attitude of servanthood and as a result of God's powerful working in a person's life. They're being used for the mutual building up of each other inside of a church body. We are all interconnected. We all belong. We all have a role to do inside of the church. You ever wonder that? You ever sit in your pew and wonder, what's my role? I hope you have, actually. I hope you have a role, even better yet, that you're doing. But if you're not, and you're sitting inside the church and you're saying, I don't really have a role, I don't do anything, I come to church, worship God, and go home, then I want to encourage you to think about what role does God have for you inside of the church and inside of his kingdom in general. What's the role? Because if you don't know what it is, and if you're, you're not even paying attention to it, then you're missing out on a great and wonderful blessing and something that God wants you to do. The spiritual gifts are not to be confused with natural abilities. There's lots of people who have the ability to do great and wonderful things in this world. 
The spiritual gifts are far more than that. They are the manifestation of the Spirit to enable a person to do uncommon or supernatural things in the kingdom of God. As one finds diversity and unity within the triune God, so one also finds diverse gifting inside of the church. In other words, not everybody has the same gifts. The great news is that no one needs to worry about being left out. Everyone has a gift. I got thinking when I was younger, I wasn't a very good hockey player. And I was really, really bad. And I must say, my dad really loves me. And I know he does. Because he sat there countless Saturdays in a cold arena watching me play a game knowing full well I would never get a goal. Not a single time. I don't think I ever got one. I might have gotten an assist if I was lucky, but I don't remember ever getting a goal. My only purpose on that team, it seemed to be anyway, according to the coach, was any time that we were losing really bad and somebody was out there from the other team that was exceptional, he would tell me, you go skate beside that person. That's all I want you to do. That's your role. Don't worry about getting the puck. Don't worry about taking the puck away and going and getting a goal with it. That's not your role. Your role is just simply to go out and basically get close to him because I know you're going to trip over your own two feet and you're going to wipe that person out. You'll never get a penalty because every ref knows you can't skate. Now, when people picked me, especially not not inside of the arena, but in, in your local pond on teams whenever they pick somebody, I was always the last to be chosen. And I was always the one that everybody looked at and said, I really don't want that person. Have you ever had that experience where you're one of the last people to be chosen for something because you're not very good at it? You know what? The reality is that's not the way it works in God's kingdom. God's kingdom, every single person belongs. In God's kingdom, every single individual has the ability to do whatever God wants them to do, and he enables them. And that's a great part. Nobody, I mean, nobody gets left outside of God's kingdom. Nobody. The Bible gives a variety of these spiritual gifts, these supernatural abilities. And and they're found all over the place inside of Scripture, like 1 Corinthians 4, 7 to 10, Romans 12, 6 to 8, Ephesians 4, 11, 1 Peter 4, 11, and so on. There are lists that are contained within the Bible of spiritual gifts, but none of them seem to be complete. All of them have different listings. They don't have the exact same gifts that are listed. And ultimately, I think the reason for that is, is there are many gifts, and they're not meant to be exhaustive. And the gifts I'm going to talk about today, they won't be exhaustive. They won't be all the gifts, but they'll be some of the primary ones. Even though it might offend our individualistic tendencies, and we all got them, God picks you to do a specific role. God does not pick you to do all the roles in the church. I want to stop right there. I hope, I hope you got that point. I really do. God has not picked you, whether you are the pastor, whether you are the worship leader, whether you are somebody who takes up the offering, whether you're somebody who counts the offering, whether you're somebody who cleans the church. God has not picked you to do every single role in the church. No. He's picked you for a specific role, maybe one or two, but at the most to do inside the church, but not every one of them. There is one body Paul talks about, but there's a whole bunch of diverse gifts and we're supposed to have a whole bunch of different roles and we're supposed to do our roles and build each other up in the faith. So I want to start off with that and say, not everybody has all the roles. Nobody does really. Only Jesus does. Jesus is the guy who's in charge of everything. We have a specific role that we're supposed to do. That's a great part. Everybody's got a role, but nobody has them all. It is only in what God has gifted you to do that you could do greater things than you could ever ask or imagine. It's only in what God has gifted you to do that you're going to do supernatural things. Have you ever been inside of a church and you watch somebody struggle? You ever be in a situation where maybe you have volunteered to do something inside the church and you find out, Oh my goodness, that's tough. I, I just, I don't like it. I just don't enjoy it. It seems like work to me, not a joy. It does, I don't have no passion for it and I'm not getting any good results. Well, it's a pretty good indication then if that is true, that you're not gifted in that area. Because when you're gifted, you have passion and you will see miracles in Jesus' name in that area that you are gifted. Praise be to God for that. Now, I want to say, the reason why God gives us these divine roles is to build each other up in the faith. We're First and foremost, we're supposed to honor God with our gifts. We're supposed to point to God in everything that we do. 
when we do something spectacular inside of God's kingdom, then we're supposed to point to God and say, praise be to God, God enabled that. God is the one who gets all the glory and all the credit and all the honor and not the person. Absolutely. The second reason why we're given spiritual gifts is to build each other up in the faith, to work together with one another. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God. We're being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord and the Spirit. We're being transformed daily, but we always need help, especially from God, first and foremost, but also from one another. We need to build each other up in the faith. So above all, the gifts are to be used in obedience and to point to the glory of God the Father in heaven. But ultimately, we also got to build each other up. We've got to acknowledge ultimately that we need each other and we especially, of course, need God. Also, it is essential for the spiritual health of the church of all believers to use their gifts to accomplish diversified roles in the church. The gathering of the church worship is not a group of people. It's not just a group of people that come together and they sing songs and they read the Bible and they pray. It's far more than that. It's a grouping of saints who come together with a whole bunch of spiritual gifts, with a whole bunch of different divine roles to accomplish inside of that church for the honor and the glory of God Almighty. That's what a church is supposed to be. If you really want to manifest God to the world, then we as a church ultimately must stand up and say we want to use the gifts that God has given us. You know what? Nothing is worse than us to superficially say that we love God or worse yet, hypocritically have a bunch of words roll off of our tongue in which we have no desire whatsoever to show passion that we love God and we want to serve him. They will only know you are a Christian and see God's love in your life through the manifest power of the Holy Spirit. And they got to see, the world's got to see us love each other and build each other up in the faith to know that we have something they don't have. If everyone in the church used their spiritual gifts rather than their natural ones, I think the church would shine. I think we would be a beacon of light and a beacon of hope in the community. I think our churches would be filled because ultimately this is what God wants us to do. God would bless us beyond all measure. As it is, as you know, there's usually two or three people or more that do all the work inside of a church when God really wants everyone to do the work. Can you imagine what it would be like just for a moment? How much challenge it would be and what a beautiful blessing it would be if everybody said, I know my gift and I want to use it. Can you imagine the ministries even a small church could do if everybody jumped in and said, I want to serve? We simply cannot and must not try to accomplish great things in God's kingdom without his help. For that would be dust building upon dust and be pure vanity. We have to ask God for help. But I think we also have to help one another in the Lord Jesus Christ too as well. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the giftings that we can have. And I'm going to just talk about some of the main ones. Now Paul talks about it in the passage today and he mentions several of them. And I want to say it's not going to be an exhaustive list, but it's going to be some of the primary ones. And I just want to go through it just to get you excited, to start thinking about some of the possible roles maybe God has assigned to you. While well, all that are born again have, have you know, uh, faith, and I think we all do. We all got some kind of faith, don't we? We can't get born again unless we have faith in a risen Savior. But when Paul says, he jumps forward at the very first, and he says, this kind of faith is a little bit different. Some people are enabled with the kind of faith that ultimately can move mighty mountains and the kind of faith that can help the church through exceptional times. Those kind of individuals have the gift of faith that goes way beyond just the faith in which we get saved. I wish Paul went into more detail about that, but he doesn't. Some believers are, are given uh, so much ability to understand the deeper things and the mysteries of God and, and that it's almost incredible. And you know what? We all have the Holy Spirit. We all have the ability to understand what God has written in His Holy Word. But there are some people that are able to see insight into God's Word and know how to apply His Word to a given situation in a way that's God-honoring. They just have that uncanny, I should say, not uncanny, but spiritual ability to take God's word and always to apply it rightly. Not everybody has that gift. Some people read God's word and they don't see how to apply it. And a lot of people struggle with trying to figure out from God's word, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live my life? What do these words mean to me specifically and how do I live them? 
Some people are just wise. They have the spiritual gift of wisdom and they know what God wants them to do in just about every circumstance because of that gift. And I got thinking, what a beautiful gift that is. Wow, that's awesome. Others are given the ability to heal. Some people have the ability to lay their hands on somebody and, and pray to God and say, Lord, would you heal them? And lo and behold, they actually get healed. I got thinking about Paul, who by merely touching his handkerchief, the person would get healed. Or I got thinking about Peter, who merely his shadow casted over you could end up in a healing. That's amazing. That's awesome. Now, that's the apostles. But there are people today that are capable of, through the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, of healing people. Others have the ability to speak in tongues. An unlearned human or possibly angelic language or languages, and they speak to God. For most people, when they hear somebody speaking in tongues, it sounds like gibberish. It sounds like a whole bunch of nonsense, a whole bunch of words or partial words or maybe not even words at all that don't make any sense whatsoever. This is why in Scripture it says, never speak in tongues without an interpreter. There are some people who have that gift to interpret tongues. They can listen to whatever the person speaks, and they're speaking to God now. They're speaking a language that God understands. It's not gibberish. It's actually very intelligent speaking, and they're talking to God, and there are people that can interpret that and, and translate it into whatever language that you have and tell everybody about it. Praise be to God for that. You know what? The reality is that this is one of those gifts that is absolutely amazing. A little bit misunderstood. Not everybody gets the gifts of tongues. Some do, but a lot of people do not, okay? Uh, some receive the gift of prophecy. Well, the gift of prophecy in the Old Testament mostly referred to, you know, judgment, God's judgment upon a people. And then God would speak to a prophet and tell the prophet, this is the message I want you to give to my people. Either you correct your ways or I'm going to punish you severely. Usually that's what a prophet was in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, not so much. In the New Testament, it relates more to the ability to have pastoral insight to the needs of the persons, the communities, the situation, with the ability to address these in a God-given utterance. In other words, basically a role almost like a pastor. And yet others receive the God-given ability to test the spirits. Now, when people jump up in the middle of a church, and they often do, and they say, I heard God speak, and, and this is what God told me we ought to do. Sometimes, often, I hope, that message does come from God. But other times it doesn't come from God at all. It comes from the devil. And, you know, it's really hard sometimes in a church when you have opposing points of view to know which points of view are personal and which ones are God-given, which ones are come from the devil and he's trying to mess up the church, and which ones actually come from our Creator. That's tough to do sometimes. And you have some people that are able to do that. They're able to listen to and be able to, to pray to God, and they're able to discern which voice that they hear actually comes from God and which one does not. And we really need that inside of today's church. The point I'm trying to make here is that we've got a whole bunch of different gifts. These gifts are not representative of the full list. This is just some of the gifts that Paul's talking about here. But the, here's the point I'm trying to make here. Think about the gifts that God might have given you. Think about whatever role God might have assigned to you. If you don't know what it is, there's lots of ways to find out. There's lots of spiritual gift testings that you can do to try to figure out what God wants you to do in your life. But whatever it might be, whether it's healing, whether it's wisdom, whether it's you know discerning between spirits or speaking in tongues or whatever it might be, do it with all your heart. Do it with passion. Do it with the understanding that you first and foremost want to glorify God and obey Him. And secondly, you want to build up the body of Christ for His name's sake. So that's what I'm trying to get you to think about. So think about those gifts. I got thinking the next part is really important here. I want to say every single role is important inside of God's kingdom and every single role has equal value. No matter what spiritual gift God gives you, whether it's faith, knowledge, wisdom, prophecy, physical healing, speaking in tongues, or discernment, the divine role assigned to you is always perfect. Remember what I said at the first. We went through that. I said, do you think God ever makes a mistake? And I'm hoping on the other end of the tape, you've said, no, pastor, I don't believe God's ever made a mistake, ever. Then don't think even for a moment God's made a mistake in your life. Whatever role God's assigned you is perfect for you. 
I don't know how many people I meet that ultimately God's tapping them on the shoulder and he wants them to do something inside of the church. But the first thing they do, like Moses, is give a whole bunch of excuses. I don't want to do that, Lord. I, I'm not capable. I, I can't speak or I can't act or I can't, I can't feed the poor or, or I'm shy and I'm bashful and I can't talk or, or I don't know if I got a good enough voice to sing or, or, or. You know what the reality is, is instead of us thinking that God made a mistake, maybe we should rejoice that we know what gift God has given us and then use that gift for his honor and glory with everything we have. Just because one member is gifted ultimately inside of the church, though, to preach, I think, and, and, and another one to heal, that doesn't mean that one's better than the other. If you're rolled inside of the church, and it might be, just to spend time in prayer. Maybe you're one of those prayer warriors. And your role inside of the church is basically to look at the needs of the church and to take those needs home and to pray about them. You know what? You have an incredible and beautiful and wonderful role. Live it. Live it. Please do. Please live that. We need more prayer warriors. Absolutely. If your role is to get out in front of the church and preach, then do that with all your might and all your strength. Don't avoid the call. If your role is to get up and be a worship leader, then do that. Because that's what God wants for you. But ultimately, don't think that whatever role you have is any better than anybody else's. It's the same. It's of equal value to everyone. If one were to trivialize or marginalize the contribution made by any member in the community, especially yourself, then that would mean that God made a mistake. That would mean ultimately that some gifts or doing God's will is more important for some but not for others and that's not the way god is god doesn't show you know injustice to people we talked about that god doesn't show partiality in other words favoritism for one and discrimination against another that's not the way that god handles us god wants us to serve and everything that he asks us to do is beautiful in his sight divergent gifts also don't point to divergent purposes i think this is where the church really struggles sometimes you know what? God has a role, a divine task, a vision, so to speak, of where your church is supposed to go. God has things that he ultimately wants you to work on as a church. Whatever those might be, the church body has to come together and say, yes, Lord, you choose those, you pick those, you give us our direction. Sometimes we get a little bit confused and we think the individuals in the church are supposed to pick that vision, that those goals, those dreams, and that's certainly not true. God doesn't give us all these giftings so that we can pull the church in multiple directions. No, he gives us all these giftings so that once we know his vision for the church, we jump on board and we participate. That's why we have these gifts. Since each member of the church is interconnected and dependent upon all other members, no one has the right to claim superiority. No one, not a single individual, has a right to jump up and say, I'm better than everybody else because of the position I hold in the church. And at the same time, though, nobody has the right to jump up and say, I'm nobody inside of the church. That's a reality. You know what? Though they were bestowed by some lesser power of, or authority... Lest we think that, which is not true, all our gifts are beautiful in God's sight and the reality of, of equal value. Since God does not make mistakes and each of us are fearfully and wonderfully made with a divine purpose in mind, we are to rejoice that in his mercy and grace we have been given and divinely enabled to do amazing things inside of his kingdom. Above all, never forget that one is obligated to serve he who purchased us at the very price of his own life without taking any individual credit for any of his works. As we work inside of the church and God starts doing miracles in Jesus' name through us, we've got to give him the honor and glory. How many times do you have that you've seen that a church has grown and, and they get really big? And next thing you know, everybody wants to interview the key leaders and ask them, how do you go about doing it? And of course, they talk about their programs. They talk about this program, that program, that program. But what they sometimes fail to do, the first thing they ought to do, and that is to praise God. God helped us grow. It's because of our obedience to God that we grew in the first place. And that's what we've got to do. In everything that we do, we've got to say, thank you, Lord. You're the one who enabled me to do it. Now, let's get really, really personal here. What does this matter? You know what? The reality is, is that the whole sermon that I've given you so far, does it make any difference in your life? 
You know, it's not really going to make any difference unless you have passion. Unless within your heart you have passion that you are created in the image of God and you have been gifted to do great things in God's kingdom. But unless you have passion to do those things, whatever that divine role is for you in God's kingdom, unless you've got passion to figure out what that is and the willingness to do it, then it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It matters to God, of course, but in the end, it doesn't matter to you, and therefore, you're not going to do it. There are so many people, unfortunately, Christians, who sit in the pew, and they don't do anything inside of God's kingdom. They, I don't know whether they don't feel that they, maybe they don't belong, or maybe they feel they are not gifted in that way, they don't have any special role or what it is, but they don't sit and do it. They don't do anything. They just sit there. And that's not what God's looking for. You know what? We need an abundance of passion to serve, not self. We're very good at doing that. We have to have a passion to serve God. How can one say that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love the people, your neighbors, especially those inside of the church, how can you say you love them when you're not willing to build them up in the faith and you're not willing to show your love for God by using the roles he's given to you? Very hard to do, isn't it? It's impossible. You can't go to God and say, oh, I love you, Lord. I think you're awesome and amazing, Lord. I think you're great. I think you're beautiful. I think you're wonderful. I think you're, you're perfect in every way, shape, and form. But, Lord, you must have made a mistake when you gave me that role to do because I don't want to do it. You know, it doesn't work that way, does it? God doesn't make any mistakes. Proverbs 4.23 says, Out of our heart, we've got to have this wellspring, this desire to serve God with all our hearts. Passion burns. Passion should set us aflame. Passion should ignite us. Passion should give us a desire, a sense of urgency so profound. That's the only thing we can think about. That's the only thing we want to do in life. Where is your passion? The problem is that many Christians face today is that they have been freed from the entanglement of sin, but they continue to love the ways of this world. They honor self far more than they do God. And as a result of that, they don't bow their knee to God. and They don't ask the crucial question, what do you want me to do in your kingdom? I know whatever it is, it's right. It has to be right because you're perfect, God. But we don't ask because we don't necessarily want to know. This is why so many believers, I think, are living lives that are void of power and barren of fruit. If only we would fully submit to our Creator's will and have faith that He will help us take care of our family, our time, you know, our, our money, all the things of this world, then we would have lots of time free. If we just said, you know what, Lord, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm still going to you know, do my due diligence when it comes to taking care of my family and my finances, but Lord, I hand that all over to you, that would free us up with so much time to actually serve in his kingdom. So much energy, too. How much energy do we waste worrying about the things of this world when we could be serving God? You know what? We've got to make room, I think, within our hearts by kicking out all those evil desires that we have for the things of this world. Kick those out with the power of the Holy Spirit. Remove those and replace those with a desire to serve and to serve Him rightly. If we continue to allow our excuses to reign within us, then we will undoubtedly go to our graves with nothing to show for eternity at all. If we want to honor God, then we must refuse to merely go through the religious motions of a one-hour service without embracing the divine role God has given us 24-7 all the time. I got thinking about a clock. You know what? In Where I'm doing the sermon today, I, I can hear a clock in the background and it's ticking. It's going click, click, click. And as it ticks, I know it's going forward. It's not going backwards. Too bad it wouldn't go backwards once in a while and I get more time. But it goes forward. It goes tick, tick take forward. We've only got so much time left. We've only got so much time to embrace God. We've only got one life to live. The question is, are we going to live it in the way God wants us to? Are we going to supernaturally allow the Spirit of God to mold us, change us, to form us into the ambassadors and the royal priests we're supposed to be? That's the question. Are we willing to bow our knee to Jesus and say, here, take my whole heart. You deserve it anyway. You bought me at a price. Here's my whole heart. Now, what do you want me to do? I'm ready. I'm getting the passion. Boy, you've ignited me on fire. Now I want to serve. Is that what we're going to do with our lives? I got thinking if we should pass away and God would give us the, the incredible opportunity, let's say, to write something on our tombstone. Think about this for a moment. 
you pass away, you're gone, and, and you're, 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 God says, I'll let you write something on your own tombstone, okay? What would you write on there that would have any meaning from your life? Eternal meaning, that is. Unfortunately, for many Christians, it would be blank. We would have to say, I really haven't got anything to write because I did not know my spiritual gifts. And I read one study that says about 85 to 90 percent of all Christians don't know what their spiritual gifts are. And number two, the ones that do know their gifts, the majority of them don't use them. So what would you write on that tombstone? Nothing. Nothing. What a shame, you know, to spend 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years or maybe even more on the face of this earth and not actually do anything for our creator when he gave us those gifts to use. That's sad. That's really sad. So let's go back to the first. Does God ever make a mistake? No. So when God gave you spiritual gifts, and he has, and he's given you a divine role, did he make a mistake? No. And has he given you the ability to do things far greater than you could ever ask or imagine and do miracles inside of his kingdom in his name? The answer is yes. So now the question is, why not do it? Why not serve him? Why not get some passion? Why not get some desire? The things that you accomplish in this world are going to be here today and gone tomorrow. There'll be nothing written about you specifically that anybody's going to remember any length of time. Even the greatest people in this world, some of the ones that are written about in the history books, we don't know them personally. We only can read a few facts about them, but we really don't know them, do we? The same is going to be true about us, but the things that are going to last forever are going to be the things that we work for, the treasures that we get up in heaven. So what are you working for? What are you working for? You know what? You can work for self. That's kind of a crapshoot, isn't it? The reality is we can work for self, but that's, we're never going to be satisfied with what we have. We're always going to want more. We're always going to covet more things. We're never going to be happy. Our souls will forever search for that divine purpose of which we were called. And the moment we get in that divine purpose, then we're going to be satisfied because God's going to grab a hold of our hearts and say, thank you. You're finally doing what you're supposed to do. Well, no. The Spirit will testify with our spirit and tell us, you're on the right track. You're doing what you should do. Now continue to do it. I will give you the strength. I will give you the power. I'll give you the might. I'll give you the knowledge. I'll give you the expertise. I'll give you whatever you need to be successful in my kingdom. But you got to have some passion. you got to want to. So, let me finish with a question. What are you doing with the life that God has given you? Are you using your spiritual gifts, in other words? If not, why not? I know that's more than one question, but it's all the same. Where is your passion to serve God? Where? I hope and pray that you get it. If you don't know what your spiritual gifts are, and I want to finish with this, please go look online. There's lots and lots of spiritual tests that you can take and you can find out what your gifts are and then start serving him. And that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me too as well, to always know our gifts and always serve God. May God bless you today and may you get that passion to live for him. Amen and amen. God is so good.